I can just try to summarize a few of my takeaways related to the talks that I heard and also the, the topic of biomarkers in OA for this session. Um, so there's, you know, there's definitely a significant unmet need here, and we all have a shared goal of reliably evaluating and making available in a timely manner to patients uh, drugs that are safe and effective and improve how patients with OA function and feel. And in particular, focusing on potentially disease-modifying drugs. We want drugs that prevent or reduce the long-term risk of sustained severe pain or severe functional impairment or the risk of a total joint replacement. In trying to achieve that shared goal, I, I wanna start by just discussing the potential roles of, of biomarkers. Um, in particular, the kinds of either the biochemical markers or the structural X-ray or MRI outcomes that we that we heard about today, and their potential role as surrogate endpoints to be used as primary endpoints to confirm effectiveness in phase three trials. Um, as Dr. Fleming and Dr. Siegel noted and nicely explained with some causal diagrams and some and some case studies. Correlation between a biomarker and a clinical endpoint of interest, you know, for example, in an epidemiologic study or in the placebo arm of a clinical trial, is, is not sufficient to support that, that that biomarker can reliably predict clinical benefit and confirm the effectiveness of a drug. Now, ultimately, the support for use as a, as a surrogate endpoint depends on evidence coming from multiple large long-term trials showing that drug effects on the biomarker can reliably predict uh, drug effects on the clinical endpoint. So focusing just on, say, quantitative MRI as an example, we'd want to see results across multiple trials showing a reliable relationship between effects or lack thereof on a specific MRI-based endpoint and drug effects on, say, long-term development of sustained severe, severe pain or severe function or joint replacement. Unfortunately, at this time, the available evidence supporting the biomarkers that, that have been discussed today is largely limited to studies that show some degree of correlation between the biomarkers and the long-term clinical endpoints, um, for example, in epidemiologic studies or in the placebo arms of clinical trials. Um, and therefore, and also considering the complexity of the disease that the speakers described, including um, Nikolai, I don't think the evidence is currently sufficient to understand the duration or the magnitude of the effects on any of these biomarkers that would be necessary to reliably predict direct benefit to the patient in the long term and to ensure that those, those benefits will exceed the drug risks. So to address the significant unmet need and to, and to bring safe and effective therapies to OA patients, we really need long-term controlled trials to reliably evaluate the effects on long-term measures of how patients function and feel. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the next session discussion to advance um, possible approaches related to this topic. And importantly, such trials will not only reliably evaluate the benefit risk of new potential disease modifying drugs, but they'll also help further develop biomarkers, including opening the door for potential future use of, of biomarkers as surrogate endpoints as knowledge and evidence grows. And my final, final comment is I just really want to emphasize the points made in multiple talks that biomarkers can have many other very important uses in drug development other than their use as surrogate endpoints in phase three trials. And there are different expectations around the types of evidence that are, that's needed to support different contexts of use. And for certain biomarkers and certain contexts of use, sufficient evidence may already exist. Um, so just to name a few possible alternative roles, there could be value in advancing OA drug development for use as early phase proof of concept studies, for use as diagnostic or prognostic purposes to identify uh, patients to include in trials, um, for evaluation of safety, for use as baseline covariates for adjustment in statistical analyses to improve feasibility. These are many alternative uses, and I, and I really encourage further consideration and discussion on these. Um, so uh, thanks very much. I'll, I'll stop there and, and looking forward to the rest of the panel discussion. Thanks, Greg. You covered pretty much all the questions that I had in mind here, but uh, it was useful. It was a certainly useful uh, framework of the meeting discussion. 
Um, so next. I can go next mm -hmm. if sure. it's okay. Of yeah. Course. Yeah. Thanks, Nicola, for the introduction and uh, thanks, uh, organizer, for inviting me to the panel. I really enjoyed very much the outstanding presentations in the session and the previous one. So, uh, just uh, very quickly, as a member on the Art Artist Foundation OA Clinical Trial Network uh, Steering Committee, I would like to use this uh, as an opportunity to introduce a network to the community very briefly. So as uh, Dr. Steve Taylor uh, mentioned uh, at the very beginning of the workshop, that uh, this, uh, the Art Artist Foundation OA Clinical Trial Network was established in 2017 with a goal to establish an infrastructure and basically a network that can help to accelerate future OA drug trials with a site that are ready to recruit patients and collect data. And currently, this uh, network is uh, spearheaded by Dr. Jason Kim from Arthritis Foundation and leaders in the academic and the clinical fields, including Dr. Martin Lowe's and uh, David Fawson. And we have members of uh, leading clinicians and researchers in the field. So the network expanded from four sites uh, at the beginning to 12 sites now with more than 70 uh, members today. And the network has been focused on the groundwork, including the uh, the multi-vendor, multi-site cross-validation of part of T1 row T2 imaging, uh, as Shamir uh, mentioned very briefly, and the biomarker measures to establish sites, again, which are ready for patient recruitment, as well as to collect a high quality data for both of our specimen and uh, quantitative imaging. So the uh, network currently has uh, sponsored several uh, cohort study and trials, including PTOA uh, for uh, uh, the patient who had the uh, PTOA and uh, would like to start performing clinical trials on OA novel drugs, uh, hopefully very soon. So uh, with that, uh, if I may, I would also like uh, to make a few quick comments as an uh, imaging researcher focusing on quantitative imaging development for OA. I would like to echo what uh, Sharmila mentioned very briefly in her talk that um, the standardization of imaging measures for both acquisition and analysis of post-processing and to evaluate the inter-vendor inter-site variation are critical. And along this line, both the KIBA MSK committee, co-chaired by Dr. Thomas Link from USSF and myself, and the AFOA Clinical Trial Network have made efforts towards this direction. So with a sponsor from Arthritis Foundation and NIH, we now have the cross-validated T1 row and T2 imaging on all major MR vendor system. And the Kiva MSK committee has also worked on the profile with recommendations of a TROT2 imaging acquisition and processing method. And uh, in addition, that uh, with AI technique, we have seen that we do not now we don't need the people to do the tedious manual segmentation and processing, and the automatic method is more consistent and reproducible. So I really think we are probably at a prime time that we can potentially apply this quantitative imaging method in large clinical trials. But I think there are still some roadblocks um, that I would like to mention. One is, uh, for example, we would need uh, help from our industrial colleagues uh, and partners to have these advanced techniques, uh, for example, T1 row imaging as a product sequence. So they can be used in large clinical trials instead of uh, just within a few academic uh, centers. And or we would like to know what information or what we can do to help that uh, our industry partner would need from us in order for them to move forward. And secondly, is um, we for regarding back to this uh, as uh, uh, along the line to have uh, quantitative imaging as a potential surrogate marker. We talk about the uh, the data reproducibility, discrimination ability, as uh, summarized by very two recent uh, nice uh, systematic review and meta analysis by McKay and uh, Ardi, uh, Ar Ar Arkinson, um, respectively. But uh, they are limited to cross sectional evaluation. So I feel as a field, probably it would be helpful if we at least begin to work together, maybe have another systematic review on so far the longitudinal study for T1 and T2, and to see what we have done regarding that prediction ability to cartilage loss or pain or other clinical endpoints along the line, again, to potentially have this uh, imaging measures as a potential surrogate biomarker, and then we'll see what we have done and uh, what we need to be done. So we can move forward as a as a as a field. So those are two quick comments I would like to make. Thank you. But thank you so much, uh, Juan. Um, I think what you just um, uh, talked about sort of underscores the importance of the highly collaborative and and uh, efforts across multiple stakeholders to to 
make progress uh, in the field of osteoarthritis biomarker development and ultimately generating data that might be needed uh, to achieve the goals of using these biomarkers for, uh, for example, even for approval. So uh, thank you for sharing this information. Um, and I think last but not least, uh, Morton, Chris Dale, you have a few words before we move to the, que to the, to the questions. I'll, <clears throat> I'll try to be very brief and thank you to the Arthritis Foundation and FDA for inviting me. Um, so, so I'm, I'm interested in, and think we need uh, biomarkers that correlate to outcome. And the reason I'm here, I, I may be the one that has faced the most uh, phase three studies in, in OA, and we want to, to use that information to, to forward the field. Uh, and what did we learn? Uh, we learned that few patients progress, which means we need to uh, enrich. And if I could dream, I would like a biomarker uh, that would um, associate it with the prediction of a given mode of action on the critical path of that particular compound. Then, then I've been in the bone field for more than 20 years now, and, and I, I think sometimes we can learn things from the bone field. And I've said that a few times, and I would like to emphasize it. And, and what did we learn? Well, we learned in the bone field that a four phase two study, four phase two study, bone mill density was actually pretty good. But we still needed to do a phase three outcome study with 3,000 patients followed for three years because the event rate was less than 1%, but it was feasible. So let's not be afraid, but let's do it right. In addition, we learned that bone resorption biomarkers uh, were actually able to be predicting if a treatment would be working on, on BMD and later uh, bone mineral density and later on, on outcome, the Chibo fractures, uh, which is the uh, endpoint. And that actually meant that there was changing for the bone field because now we didn't need a one year study with a thousand patients. We could do a study that we believed in uh, with uh, fewer patients uh, for a few months looking at bone biomarkers. And so, um, uh, so not 500 patients for one to two years, but uh, 100 in, in a few months. And I think that's super important with biomarkers that call it to outcome. And so I think part of what I'm, I'm looking for, of course, we want to advance the field and I think there are many similarities as Virginia has said to other fields. So to me, the question is also, how do we actually give drug developers the confidence to, to move into a phase three clinical study with that many patients for so long time? How do we do the phase two study with a biomarker or combination of biomarkers in a way that it would allow us the confidence to invest in long-term outcome studies, just as we have done in the osteoporosis field? I think we see that now for OA, and we definitely see that now for the NASH field. So I'm super interested in outcome biomarkers and, and want to do whatever we can do to, to put that forward. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. This was, I think, very important um, point um, that you shared. And I think um, certainly very relevant um, to, to sort of help frame the discussion around the use of biomarkers and their role and potentially the uh, end game or the end uh, result, which we all hope that based on the discussions that we have today and in future meetings, we'll get there. Um, but, but I think it's important to, to realize that there might be still options to be explored to get to these answers so that everyone feels confident in the uh, use of these biomarkers in whatever context ultimately potentially as a surrogate endpoints. So I think maybe we should move to some questions um, that we drafted, unless someone or anyone has any, any other thoughts. So there are actually a couple of questions that came in the Q&A uh, chat, which is, uh, you know, which relate to uh, the kind of information or the level of evidence needed uh, to establish uh, a biomarker as a surrogate endpoint versus a predictive or um, um, prognostic biomarker. Does anyone want to take a stab at this? Again, um, it can be a very high level discussion because we don't have a lot of time, but opening the stage here. I can um, start maybe, or David, did you want to start? Um, no, I mean, I think you guys talked about it. I, I guess I would 
append to that question uh, for both Tom and you and Greg Levin, a question of advice to the osteoarthritis community. It sounded like, based on what you guys all said, that surrogate outcomes, surrogate biomarkers are really not in the cards right now because there's not an effective therapy um, that is, uh, is emerging from trials. So I think one of the questions that would emerge from that earlier question is, given this situation and that we don't have trials that, that uh, stop or retard the osteoarthritis, we don't have, we don't have uh, treatments that do that from which we can draw trial evidence. What's, is there a process um, for the development of surrogate outcomes that might uh, 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 make more rapid um, the development of effective therapies? And if not, um, what, what would you suggest to the osteoarthritis clinical trials community as to how they might proceed? How would you develop enrichment designs or something else um, that would help us all move this field forward? I think you've heard this is a, there's a big need here. Um, and we're faced with an uh, uh, absence of effective therapies that, uh, uh, that limit or retard structural and other progression of disease. So um, give us some, give the osteoarthritis community and industry some suggestions about, if you could, about how to best uh, proceed. I, I like to learn from our past experiences, even though every setting is unique. Um, there are certain principles that apply. I, I like what you were just saying about enrichment and oncology. Huge steps have been made with understanding who are the people that are most likely to be benefited based on the nature of mechanism of action of our interventions. In HIV, it took us a long time, but we persisted. The first level of surrogate endpoints there were CD4 counts. <laughs> and we failed for many years because that was an indirect measure. Uh, then when we had the technology to understand viral load, yes, that's the principal causal pathway, is having antivirals to reduce viral load. The combination of that biological understanding with then, as Greg Levin was indicating, we need to have the clinical trials that ultimately are going to give us the meta-analyses. It's, it's a combination of having that clinical data that allows us uh, to identify what are the very likely principal causal pathways, having interventions and understanding with the plausibility that they're going to have positive effects on those pathways. But to be fair, what could their unintended effects be? And because that's an inexact science, putting that together with meta-analyses of trials. So in other settings where successes have been achieved, it didn't just happen. It happened with an aggregation of all of those approaches and, and the ability to be disciplined and to gather the evidence over time. And as you said, we need to have some trials that are positive and some less positive to understand the distinction between what were the biological effects that led to clinical benefit versus the ones that didn't. Are there others that want to, that was very helpful, Tom. Are there others that want to speak to this, including those from the OA community? Jeff, you started this discussion. Did you want to add? Sir, were you uh, calling on me? You said the OA community. I wasn't sure if you meant. No, no, no. I, I, but you were the original person that this question was targeted to. So I wondered if you might want to respond. Yeah, I, I wanted to maybe just start with a um, uh, technical comment about the predictive biomarker. So predictive biomarker, predictive biomarker is a specific biomarker that identifies patients who uh, will respond to the drug as compared to patients who won't. If you have a group of patients who do and a group of patients who don't respond, it makes it that much more difficult um, to uh, demonstrate that there's a clinical benefit. Unfortunately, predictive biomarkers often are product specific or mechanism of action specific, um, so it can be difficult uh, to define those. I think, um, to my mind, um, where we're going to see the most progress in the next few years is uh, public-private partnerships that are able to put together uh, data sets of um, uh, radiographic information over time uh, combined with uh, uh, signs and symptoms uh, information 
like the FNIH and some of the other efforts, uh, to define the groups who are more likely to uh, worsen. If you can demonstrate that those patients worsen without treatment and that they don't with treatment, um, then it may be a way to allow you to see a clinical benefit with a smaller number of patients. Um, in some of the trials that we've seen so far, we have not really seen progression of um, uh, uh, signs and symptoms, so it's been difficult to see prevention of that with a, a therapeutic treatment. If you could define the people who would progress, that might make it a bit easier. Um, in terms of the level of evidence, so it's probably product-specific for predictive biomarkers. For prognostic biomarkers, um, it's not product-specific. You're just trying to define a um, group of patients who, when followed over time, will progress more. And I think we've seen some evidence to suggest there are some uh, groups of patients like that. It'd be nice to see that confirmed in other studies, but uh, I would think those would be a good group of patients to study. Nikolai, you want to? Yeah, I guess I guess the point of evidence needed to support something as a surrogate endpoint will probably come in the last session discussion, because that that's more on the documenting or assessing the clinical uh, outcome and how to tie this to the biomarker. So maybe we can fund that that discussion for the uh, session three panel. Um, so um, I I had one question maybe for Emily again uh, as a patient, um, which is um, how, how does the reliance on a surrogate endpoint or a biomarker impact the uh, level of acceptable risk for you as a patient? For example, if a drug is to be approved based on a surrogate endpoint, um, would that change your assessment of the risk uh, for such a product? Right. I think for me personally, um, because I'm young and I have um, limited comorbidities associated with my osteoarthritis, my risk assessment is probably much different than, for example, Mr. Uh, Aggie from the last session, right? And so using a surrogate endpoint does not change my risk assessment. I'm willing to take on that risk, I think, in terms of uh, potential treatments that may help with structural changes, um, which is really what I need in the long term is, is uh, drug development that will help my joint um, function better, last longer. Because um, right now I have symptomatic pain, but not every day, not someone who's living with um, consistent OA pain uh, later in life. So I think using surrogate endpoints from my perspective is a viable option and doesn't change my risk assessment because I think um, I am like my symptoms are coming from my OA as opposed to others who may have increased comorbidities, which may change their risk assessment. Th thanks, Emily. A anyone else uh, on this question? Because ultimately, I think that as we mentioned, the framework of benefit risk assessments. Uh, really takes into account uh, quantifying the benefits to think about how to quantify and balance the risk. This is the so, reason we asked that question. Oh, go ahead, David. So I, I guess I, I had a, a question about <clears throat> the FNIH and OAI uh, advantage that uh, they provided uh, to provide a large data set with a lot of sophisticated measures many of which are maybe now even outdated, um, even though it wasn't that old, a, it isn't that old in a study in terms of images and how they were acquired in terms of what, uh, in terms of what um, uh, tissues were acquired. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, there's a, a, a response on the part of folks as to whether there's a need um, to, to try to create a, a, a larger harmonized sample that might include synovial fluid and imaging uh, that uh, based on uh, Xiao Jun's and, and Charmilla's approach is harmonized, but gets yet more uh, sophisticated imaging acquisition um, that might have been done before to move forward, if possible, with prognostic biomarkers that might be meaningful. And I wondered if the imaging and, and uh, Virginia and others might, might uh, respond to that.
Yes, I'll take a shot. Thank you, David. Um, the OAI really has um, set a high bar for advances in OA. Number of papers and insights that have devolved from that are just incredible. I guess you're um, suggesting an OAI too, which I think with the more up-to-date um, um, measures, a more refined uh, measures that we've developed um, and which in large part the OAI accelerated. So I, I fully, I fully agree with that. And I think that um, emerging are these re more refined measures and um, it, it shows the strength of um, coming together and getting all of these measures in one cohort. And I think one of the speakers earlier had suggested that the clinical trials themselves should obtain all of these measures. And I think that's what we're really needing. As I said, we cannot show that the biomarker is in the causal pathway without something that modifies that causal pathway. So they're really um, going together, um, marching hand in hand, step in step. And so neither one, neither one can move forward re readily without the other. So I would not only suggest what you're, 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 you're um, ascribing, but also that the clinical trials that, on, that are ongoing really look at trying to get as comprehensive measures from all of these different types of um, domains of biomarkers that they possibly can. Yes, Sharmila. I think one of the other models is we could certainly include imaging and biomarkers like Virginia's biochemical markers from synovial fluid, et cetera. But the other issue is we are always dependent on patient reported outcomes for pain. And as part of the backpack, which is a lower back pain study, the, uh, is included a functional brain MRI study which looks at brain at pain activation, pain catastrophiz catastrophizing, and so on and so forth. So I think having a, a little bit more sophisticated evaluation of pain and patient-reported outcomes might be useful. Although if you really consider the patient's perspective, it really, the therapy does have to help the patient and their perception of pain. I think characterizing pain a bit better and actually having a few established therapies and looking at their impact on some of these features that we measure would also be quite useful. Nicole, I also you... have... Sorry, sorry, Shao Zhang. Yeah, also I have a quick comment. So if we are talking about OAI too, I think for the previous uh, large cohort OE study like OAI at the most, uh, they were very successful, but they only include patients uh, at the middle age or above. So I think if we are talking about OEI too, perhaps we should consider to include, for example, PTOA like patient like Emily, who are younger and who have a different challenges compared to our primary OA patient, different risk evaluation. So I think that will be very valuable. It, it sounds like perhaps a, even a more productive thing to do would be what Virginia and essentially Tom Fleming and others were suggesting, which is to try to harmonize the, uh, the collection of these data across trials from various sources so that, um, so that at a later point, we can try to make sense of what biomarkers would actually change in response to therapy. Um, that, that, that would be probably even more productive than doing another observational correlational study. David, um, may I add one small comment? Sure. So, so I think there's an, one more point that is in, in a very, very simple way. If I'm going to be predicting how much water there is in a bathtub tomorrow, I would like three numbers. I would like to know how much water is in the bathtub today, how much water is running in, and how much water is running out. I would never be correlating how much water is running in, how much tissue or joint is being made with how much joint you have today. So I think already by going back, looking at some of the data, uh, where that we already have, not just saying a biomarker is a biomarker, but there are biomarkers that are processes of tissue formation. There are biomarkers that are processes of tissue formation, rather than doing correlates to imaging, then combining them in optimal ways. I think there are some, some things to, uh, to harvest there. Nikolai, we had other questions. Do you want to... Uh... Um... I'm just mindful of the time that we have uh, very little for the break. Maybe we can have a few more minutes for this discussion. And I just suspect that we may need to have a separate meeting on just on biomarkers in the future. So I just want to keep that door open. And I know that uh, uh, this might be a welcome. <laughs> so 
I don't want to say the commitment. I wonder. But, but, I wonder if I could ask a question of some of the other panelists, uh, following up on David's question. Sure. Okay. Um, so a number of the um, presenters talked about uh, biomarkers that predict patients more likely to progress to joint replacement. I wonder if you could talk about whether you've defined thresholds that you could use prospectively in clinical trials to enrich for those patients and uh, if you've done any power calculations to see how much you reduce the required size of a clinical trial to show prevention of joint replacement, for example. I think you really hit an Achilles uh, tendon uh, problem here, <laughs> Achilles heel problem. I think that we have the data and we need to do those analyses. I, I, I do think the data are in hand. and. Um, those types of analyses are really where we need to go and then to have these thresholds that we can test going forward. So I love your suggestion and um, all of our statistical friends who are in the field uh, hopefully can help us with this. We really need it. Other comments? Nikolai, do you wanna bring us to a close? Um, sure, yeah. Um, so. As I mentioned, uh, there's, there's, there have been significant advantages or advances in, in identifying and developing biomarkers, both you know, biochemical and imaging biomarkers. Um, to me, it sounds like there are still outstanding question of, uh, questions about the right context for use of these biomarkers, even though some of them have you know, fairly good phase validity. Um, there's still you know, some uncertainties about um, the role of these biomarkers. Um, and I think these require additional information and data um, to ultimately decide how and which of these biomarkers should be used um, as um, surrogate endpoints ultimately, and, and which biomarkers would be more appropriate to be studied um, as a replacement of clinical endpoints. So, um, Nikolai, could I add just one quick thought sure, to this great sure. example of progression to joint replacement? And it's really amplifying what Jeffrey Siegel and Greg Levin have already said. There are many important uses of biomarkers, and we have to make sure we're keeping in mind the separation between the functions. It only takes, it only takes a correlate, uh, patient-level correlate, to be useful for diagnosis and prognosis. And, and as, as, Greg, as Greg and Jeffrey said, we can use natural history data to see whether or not a biomarker is prognostic. Is it a correlate? What predicts, in this case, progression to joint replacement more quickly versus later in time? And that's very useful for selecting patients. That's very useful as, as covariates and analyses to adjust for imbalances. A completely separate and more complex use of the biomarker is, as we've talked a lot about, as a replacement endpoint where we've said a correlate does not a surrogate make, and as a predictor where oncology has been intensively in working in trying to find the people that will benefit. And there, a prognostic factor does not a predictor make. It's not good enough to treat a lot of people and look at your biomarker and see what, how biomarker predicted under treatment progression to joint replacement. I need subgroup analyses. I need to have randomized controlled trials that allow me to see do biomarker negative patients have a worse effect than biomarker positive patients? So the two uses of biomarkers that have the greatest utility are for enrichment as predictors, where, where a prognostic factor does not a predictor make, and as replacement endpoints. Uh, and in both of those, it's doable, but it takes a lot of evidence, particularly from randomized clinical trials to understand what is a predictor as well as what is a, a surrogate? Because as Jeffrey said, those are specific to the intervention. Whereas a prognostic biomarker is specific to the disease process and is the low lying fruit. Well, I think Thanks, that's Tom. a, thank you, Tom. That was a nice summary, Nikolai. Should we, why don't we uh, uh, end this sure. session? That was wonderful comments and wonderful talks, um, both uh, by the panelists and speakers. Agreed, and thank you everyone uh, for the good discussion. I think there's more to come. <laughs>